Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us at the Korea Society's Young Professionals Network series here at the Genesis House this time, where we're so lucky to be joined by Sangha Im. She's a New York-based fashion designer who was also, in her past, an entertainer and performer and a K-pop idol as well. And somehow she migrated all of those interests and abilities into her brand. Sangha, and she's going to talk about that journey with us now. Thank you so much for joining us, Sangha Im. Thank you for having me. So excited because to me, you are OG K pop star. <laughs> In the 90s, you had that hit song, musical. It was so catchy and cheeky, and everybody loved humming it. They loved performing it in norebangs. It was just such a lovely introduction for the world to see the kind of music that was coming out of South Korea at the time. So right. thank you for sharing your time with us. Let's start off by introducing people, in case they don't know, to the fact that you started as an entertainer in the music industry. And K-pop was just burgeoning at the time. It was just starting to become discovered and loved. Can you talk a little bit about how you started in the music industry and what that lifestyle was like for you as a youngster? I got to audition this children's dance and choir company. I was selected to come to the U.S. to perform. I was in sixth grade. So New York, Washington, L.A., and Hawaii for a whole month. So that was, that was an amazing, amazing experience. Was that not unnerving? Okay. No, I think I was very natural as far as the performing. Um, I wasn't really that outgoing kid, I remember. But when I go onto the stage, I, I just enjoyed it so much. When we all arrived in New York, we went all the way up to top of the uh, Empire State Building. And then I remember I was overlooking outside in the whole Manhattan city. And I think that very moment, I don't know why, um, but I think that whole manifestation started from that point. I think that epic moment, I just felt like, I remember so well that moment. Um, there was just something that I feel that I might come here again, but didn't have any plan. But um, the funny thing is all my uh, peer dancers, and um, they loved Los Angeles, and they did loved Hawaii, and Waikiki, and Disneyland, and um, we enjoyed performing here, but also when we got to tour all these like places, we were, um, and then for me, it was New York. When I was the first year of middle school, um, I switched to uh, modern dance because one day I saw um, a TV, this dancer barefoot in the subway in Paris. And to me, that's it. I'm not doing any more Korean dance. I, I need to do that. <laughs> like that's, that's what I need to do. So, it was raw and yeah, real? Yeah, it was raw, the completely raw. I mean, she was just free bird. Like she was dancing. Um, her world was just like, I, I was just sucked into that TV that day. So I said to my mom, I need to do that. And then that's her mission. So I uh, majored modern dance in college. And then in sophomore year, I did not want to do um, modern dance anymore because I wanted to do what I can do, what I do well for everyone. It was just, I loved modern dance, um, but it was too abstract. It was too, like, I wanted, like, real connection with audiences that, you know, that I have this story and then, and then they feel it, like, in, in depths of emotions. But when I was doing modern dance, we would do time to time choreography and, and then it was too progressive. I mean, it was too, like, 
you know, our movement. I don't know if they, what, how they understand this, you know? Um, I'm sure the art form, any art forms, like audience can feel it however they like to feel it. But, but I want it like direct connection, you know, direct emotional deep connection. So I'm gonna go just pop culture. So I wanted to do musicals. I auditioned musical company uh, in my sophomore year. So I got into musical company and there was very first professional musical company in Korea. Mm -hmm. So I was the youngest, I was the only student. Um, and then they accepted me, so I did the musical. In the background, like I didn't even have any line or anything like that. And then um, all my senior um, uh, musical actors and actresses, uh, they just loved me. I was very um, uh, being adored by them. And then they're like, "Oh, you should actually go and you know do TVs and and movies, and it's gonna take forever." to get a, a significant roles, or main roles. Because at the time, musical wasn't really everybody's, like now I see it, but people, you cannot attract people to come and um, pay that ticket if there's no celebrities. So, okay, so then I'm gonna go off track, but I was so innocent. <laughs> I was like, oh, TV is not real. Movie and theater is only, only The it. only real thing. Yeah, only real thing. Because so I... Then, yeah. Sorry to interrupt, but then you migrated to K-pop. Yeah, migrated to K-pop because... So, so sophomore year, I was, I was luckily, I was um, pretty popular on in, in certain area. Like people knew about me, even though I wasn't really famous. I was just a musical actress and just student, being a college student. But on like in certain area in Gangnam, um, people knew about me. So, I, so people were like um, telling me this, this agent, this manager want to meet you and those type of things and street on the street. Was that intimidating to no, be it was... thrust into an industry that was just starting to become a real economic powerhouse, mm -hmm. right? I mean, it, it was not necessary. I don't know because I was full of, I don't know what it was, but it wasn't really intimidating. I actually told them that that's not for me. It's actually not for me. And in the beginning also, and then my father was very, very conservative person. Mm -hmm. Even um, his friends would say like, I don't even know how you became that, you know, like with a father like your father. Hmm. Um, I thought that I can do better than just dancing in the background. Literally two hours musical, I, I was every single scene because I was a pretty good dancer. And then they just put me every single scene in the back. And I'm not like, you know, I, need, I, want, I want to actually do that too. So I, I think I had that desire, but um, in the beginning, I just didn't feel like, okay, this is, I was contemplating. I was not sure that if I really want to, just because I need fame, like, do I really want to go on TV, you know? And then there's all the managers and, you know, chasing after me and like, let me see, <laughs> let me rethink. <laughs> this is, I don't, like, like as much as I want that, I had different purpose, but at the same time, like, oh, I don't think that I belong there. But I can't help but wonder when musical, the song, the hit song, because I still hear it yeah, yeah. every once in a while. If I'm shopping in a Korean supermarket, I will hear it come on and it brings me back to the late 90s. So I decided to go with a manager and actually the, the, um, uh, the music producer. So, so when I signed with him, I became um, immediately morning show host, um, the weekend morning show host, but at the same time we were immediately preparing the first album. So that was, Musical was the first album song. Mm -hmm. And then it wasn't really the title song, but um, I told him that I need to put two things. One is the song, when you hear it, when you listen to that song, it's like, this is a music, this is about musical. And then that I need a song like musical, musical song. And then the, the other one is my favorite song that I want to remake, which was, it's called Nae and Nariyagi. 
it's I, I love that song. It was my um I was a uh, first year of, of middle school, and I love that song so much that I wanted to remake that. So those two things I have to put in my album. So so that was musical. That's how the musical came out. Actually, that song. We um we didn't even spend a lot of time. Um, I can't believe that because yeah. when you if you look online and you look up your live performances of that song, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's the energy that you put forward, the happiness that's just pouring out of you as you dance and sing that song is very evident. <laughs> no yeah. one can doubt that you're having fun with that. Right. So let me ask you this. Do you still feel a connection to that person? Because I, I, I want to talk about your brand, Sanga. Mm -hmm. But I want to know like how much of that experience as someone who was in the spotlight in entertainment helped to inform why you made the transition that you did. So one, do you still feel a connection to that person who was entertaining and bringing so much joy to people? Oh, absolutely. That's, um, there's a lot of layers in the different forms that I can talk about. But the one thing is that once you become um, a, some effective celebrity, it, that stays. That, that's literally in your tail, the tag in your tail. Yes, the musical had a lot to do with it, I think. There's the song musical because mm -hmm. people constantly singing it and um, the singers, the, the, um, the young singers that would in competition um, program, they would sing the song and and because it's very uplifting, very cheering. I feel so, so happy and, and flattered that people love the song, that people still sing the song. And then most importantly, that makes them feel happy right that moment. At least that when they sing that song, they get uplifted, they get happier and I mean that's the whole thing about me that was my vision ever since I was 14 years old so when I was 14 years old I was so into movies the filmmaker was my OG dream <laughs> I was I loved film scores soundtrack all the music really made me get into these old old movies I remember one time I walked I used to just go to the movie theater by myself and then I, one time I walked, I, the, the credits, um, a closing credit will come down and then I'll, and I'll turn around and I feel like, ooh, I love this feeling. You know, I'm gonna, I can't wait to go to school tomorrow. Like this feeling is just so amazing. And then that moment I thought, this is what I'm gonna do. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna do something that I can do well to make other people feel this way. It doesn't matter if it's just the one that moment in that very moment or later or like it doesn't matter like this is what i'm gonna do so that has always been my vision and um so musical i did it already so i feel like you know what i actually my vision that is that i had since i was 14 been kind of achieved you needed to challenge yourself in a different way is that why you ultimately decided to come to New York? It was, it was obviously just show business. It was entertainment business. It's a, there's a, a lot. Now I know that it was big business side of it was attacking me that I wasn't really expecting. And then now I do business. So I know what was going on, that part of entertainment. So I was just fully focused on. Um, so there was, it was a hard time that I felt. Um, Okay, so I am going. Um, I'm going to go to New York or London to study musical. And um, I mean, think about it. I was, I was, I was majoring modern dance, but I, and then particularly Alvin Ailey technique. But I never really seen Alvin Ailey performing in front of. Like I never really seen that in person. I only saw on v VHS videotape, and and I was doing musical Guys and Dolls and. But I never seen Broadway musical in person. So like, okay, I wanted to gauge myself, like how well I'm doing actually. If I actually really go there, if I see the Evan Ailey dancers, like where am I? Like where, where, where do I stand? So I came. You came to the source. But for work though, for two weeks. Okay. Yeah, and then I came here and then, um, and then I, was, I was kind of planning, like some point I wanted to, take a chance to go and do what I always um, um, hungry to do. 
uh, to learn and see experience in New York. So it was kind of not exactly like exactly when, but I had that kind of plan like some point. And then I happened to come here for uh, for work. And then I'm like, okay, so if I um, I had that plan, but maybe this is a time. So I should not go back and. If I actually go back and pack and cut, like, I don't think that's going to happen at that time. I just, so I just knew it. Stay. I decided to stay, and then I stayed, and then uh, for a year or two, and um, so I, I went right to NYU to to study film, and then, and then English. I had to learn English, so English and um, and the musical um, uh, uh, theater, dancing and singing, and then I did all of that, and then. While I was doing that, I got, um, I met and married, and so I wanted to. Life happened. Yeah, life happened, and then, and then before I got married, actually, um, while I was learning what I wanted to learn here and experience, I feel like, oh, you know what, this New York, whatever this New York City has to offer me, I think I, I there are a lot of things that I'm talent, I'm, I'm, I'm good at. <laughs> so, like, okay, fashion is this a capital city of fashion? Okay, it's so the fashion I can do. Um, okay, and then like, there's wash. Um, I think I can do that too. And then like, oh, the sh chef. I I grew up cooking all the time um, with my mom, so I think I can be chef too. So let me try one <laughs> thing. I I first try to be a chef. I did part time job at a restaurant, and then I got to see the 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 kitchen. And then when I, I was standing there looking at the kitchen, I was fascinated. I not just fascinated. I was like, I want to be there. I want to be in there. I want. It, I mean, it's military, as <laughs> as everybody knows. And then the sous chef was literally harnessing the whole kitchen. And oh my god, I need to do that. I signed up for um, uh, culinary school. So I started it, and in three months, I dropped out. And first of all, English was just really hard. The whole vocabulary for cooking is whole new language. It's another world. On my way home, I always cried and like, oh, this mm. is this is this is not just me. You know, I don't think that I'm. I should be there. You know, I can't even understand the recipe that easily, and that's not. So the right. glamour of that kind of faded away a little bit. But I loved it, though. I brought a lot of food. And well, it sounds <laughs> um, like you may have learned a lot from oh, that experience. A lot, a lot. And then after that, obviously, um, I mean, the everything, I'm a huge believer um, in connecting dots. So whatever I did, I was fortunate to have all the experience growing up. Um, because I have this desire, this level of desire that I was born with, um, self-actualization, um, and also very supportive parents, especially my mom, always convinced my dad. And then <laughs> she would run it, like, I want that, I need that. Then like, she would like, okay, so she's in mission and find the best of the best um, for learning. So everything was just, not, I mean, it was it was there to help me. So, so fashion. So after that, I moved into fashion. If, when you do fashion, like presentation is very important. Presentation skill. You're a designer. You need to present that. Um, so how did you start teaching yourself? Because I understand you spent some time. You did seek out the experts. You spent some time with a high fashion stylist. Um, and I think that was at Vogue, right? No, it was. I was in Parsons. Oh, that was at Parsons. Yeah, and then so I got the um, internship okay. and in Donna Karen, and um, and then she said, so what? Do you, she was actually she was nice, and she was caring enough to what? What do you ultimately want to do? I said, um, stylist. I thought that I'll be a stylist at first. She said, okay, then I actually have amazing, amazing stylist, and then she was the most um, is top tier, high profile stylist actually. So she sent me to her interning. Um, she has studio in sixth floor walk up building, penthouse. So I would carry literally my my size of duffel bags walking up and down the sixth floor building to her penthouse studio, um, encountering dead mouse all the time. 
all the dead time mice? on the stairs. Dead mice. Oh. And rats, like big rats on the stairs. Um, and then all over the city. <laughs> and um, sometimes there's a budget for car, and then some, a lot of times no car. So I would take subways. And, um, but the great thing is that she's such a high profile stylist, even intern. And sometimes I uh, act as an assistant as well. So I would um, be treated really well, <laughs> even with the garment bag, even with the duffel bag. And then they were like, oh, please come in and check out all our new collection. And like, okay, I'll make a note. <laughs> but the um, movie, uh, like a scene from The Devil Wears Prada, is exactly coming, coming to oh, mind oh, right absolutely. now. Absolutely, it was kind of like that. Oh, kind of like that. And I got yelled all the time mm -hmm. because my English was not that great. And if she said too fast, I would never get it. I would never get it. She would yell at me like, "This is not what I'm yelling like crazy yelling." And then I'm like, "You know what? This is like a daydreaming for me. I grew up." in the 80s, you know, we get yelled all the time from parents and teachers and we get like punished, like push up, I mean, hardcore. So I was okay. But my, um, the other uh, uh, person, assistant above me at the studio said to me, like the longest intern would stay here uh, two weeks. <laughs> After that, I became an assistant uh, to other stylists so I was like a real assistant, not intern, uh, for a year. And then when I started my own brand, I called her up. I had like, you know, I was like, I, I just launched my handbag line, by the way. She actually um, launched her own brand too, underwear and athleisure clothing line. So, so we were like, like we were both designers and but anyway so i called her up and she said even though she was very hardcore she was very soft and she was like she that i knew that kind of personality i i did so so she was like okay so what do you need and um she literally held my hand and taken me to the most uh, one of the most high profile showroom so i ended up signing with that showroom so she did a big part of uh, my beginning journey. Yeah, big support. Let me backtrack you just a little bit because I feel like many people in our audience listening to this story of you following a high profile stylist and learning from the ground up how to launch. Can you offer some lessons that you learned in how to go from just merely learning to executing a vision that you had because you started with handbags, but you've now migrated to jewelry. I'm, I'm wondering if you can talk about that, that gray space where so many people are too scared to actually make their dream come true. But at some point you had this idea that you were going to build a brand. It was gonna look a certain way. It was gonna make people feel a certain way. How did you get lift on that? airplane as you're trying to like build it on the runway as it's going like how did you make that happen i think the most important if you have that in tr your um dna if you have the trait that's amazing but if you don't i think the most important uh quality is resilience so you just be resilient and and just i mean right now also the the success formula, the winning formula is very different and, and evolved by high technology. From that time that I, I started, it was 2000, uh, I launched my line 2006. So we basically then we're talking about no Instagram. Um, the whole landscape has been evolved and changed and then it's changing every moment, rapidly changing. But I think the principle of, of um, the, the principles are the same, the timeless principle, like you have to be open-minded and um, resilient. You have to be resilient and the clear vision. Obviously, you have to have the clarity and the short goal, short-term goals. 
Uh, people I talk about dream all the time, but I always feel like dream is a little too abstract for me. What worked for me was a short term goal. So you can actually achieve. Can you give an it's, example? It's attainable. Um, anything that you have, obviously you have to have a very clear vision. The clarity is very important. But after then, it's really getting things done. Um, because this creative work is always very um, intangible in a way. You know, like how can you create, how can you like design this in like so, by certain deadline? I create one thing, check. Tomorrow, another. I mean, it doesn't come that way, right? So you just have to have that discipline, that daily goal, weekly goal, monthly goal, and then that short-term goal is what really makes your actual vision 10 years later, two years later, 20 years later, or a dream, if you will. So obviously you had the discipline to carry it through. Were there any particular obstacles or challenges that seemed very difficult for you? And can you name some of those? Because I think for people who are listening to your story, they want to know, um, they want to know the real tangible lesson that they could maybe apply to their own lives without having your talent maybe or the drive that you did. Is there, was there a particular commitment or challenge that you found difficult to overcome and how did you overcome it? Especially since you went from an industry where you're being managed to now managing your own business. Well, I have to say there's no magic. The, um, you just have to do it and over and over and over again. For instance, if I give you an example, I was talking about working in front of camera from um, uh, transitioning into camera from uh, stage, right? I just got a main role, a main character role in drama, but nothing comes to free. But it seems like, oh, she just, she just like got picked as a main character. She doesn't have, she'd never done like acting, TV acting before, and she never really done any drama before. And then she was like, boom, main character. But there's always what it comes after. I had to work 10 times more. And when we do outdoor uh, filming, like there's a also, there's a skill that you need to, you need to know. And then there's, there's a drill that you need to know. Like even like the um, soft skills, like you have to know how to mingle with, how to like, you know, mingle with those staffs and, you know, like all those things that you have to learn. I mean, it doesn't come quick enough, but I didn't know any of those. And then I, voila, you're like main character. Were so, there any skills that you felt you were missing that you had to learn on your own? Oh, like actually, you, just, you just mentioned soft skills. So Yeah, soft skills, because there's a vibe there. The Korea, the culture is very disting distinguished, I have to say. So they have their own color still. The Korean people have the culture. I mean, I think it's not a bad thing. There's a pros, pros and cons, but... So when I got into the whole, the TV crew and working with the TV crew, like director, producer, and actors, they have their own culture going on. And then like the in-between, I was, before we started the interview, I, I was talking about like, I, I'm a very, um, sensitive and then I try to enjoy the between things, between the events, between milestones, between our events, like, you know, the things. Actually today, I I talked to you, I, we're interviewing now, but before we get into this actual interview, the conversation I had with you, I think that was, that, that's, I, I know that I'm going to, I'm going to cherish that <laughs> very much later on. So that, those things, and, and then that, that really makes it, um, um, that's the real quality, that's real value. And, and I, I think Korean culture has very significantly that, like Korean culture is that. So like actual work results and all good, but you need to know how to be part of the whole group of people in community to do the work. I think, you know, you just have to do it. I love that phrase, like, just do it, it's Nike. I think a do it again is more important part. I wanna know, like when you launched your brand, mm -hmm. 
because I want to talk about the brand. I want to talk about the look <laughs> and what inspired you. Mm -hmm. I want to know what was it about your time here in New York that gave you inspiration for how your brand looks and feels? I think it was just me. It was it was just me that I what what I want to have. I was always a fashion person since I was, I think it was seventh grade. Um, I was in seventh grade, and I was living in this new development area. It's called Pampodong, and um, we we're a very first kind of like new development area. We just we were just first um, group of people who moved into that area. So there's there's a like new um, new shopping malls and new this and new that. And then one area was they sell the manufacturing. The Korea was huge manufacturing. We manufactured, you name it, Ralph Lauren and Donna Karen. We manufacture all. So there was like the clothing that it was not perfected. They just had this like huge pile of clothing that you can go in and then just $1, uh, a, a three shirts, $1. I was, I was, I was like always living in there and then grab, I had eyes that I know exactly what I wanted. I can just two, three pieces and pay $1 because my mom would, uh, would shop something. And then I said, I ditched it all. And then my mom was so upset one day, like, okay, you take care of it. So ever since that I shopped myself, so fashion was always, so I, what I want, even in New York city, like, even though I just came to New York and. I don't really, you know, know much about America and New York fashion, but what I would wear and what I want wear that I couldn't find is is always the inspiration. And then that was my market and that was my audience. I'm going to zero in on the stuff that I love mm -hmm. that you've made. Mm -hmm. The glasses that you're wearing, uh -huh. the chair earring, right. um, the handbags that kind of sit on your butt right, right. and flatter your butt. Mm -hmm. but they're also very sleek, mm -hmm. and there's nothing like extra. There's mm -hmm. nothing too frilly about it. Mm -hmm. Why do you think that is something the consumer wants? Because I think the woman that I design for is, is me. So I know that those are not out there in the market that I can easily find. And um, that's how I started. Handbag's the same, and uh, handbag was a little different because I started with the exotic skin and you know not necessarily I was really into exotic but uh, exotic skins but I saw it and I fell in love and then I ended up really doing it um and loved it but but um but jewelry is I just needed it I just needed it for myself and then um oh that's mic um yeah <laughs> that's your mic is, yeah <laughs> I needed it I wanted like jewelry like this so that I can just slip on and you know it's like a mundane like a daily jewelry item and and I'm not like you know, like a woman who can wake up and then like oh, open up the jewelry box and put it on. And then like before you go to bed, like all oh, clean up and then take it all out and put it in jewelry. I'm just not that person. I can even sleep with it. And then these are actually, I sleep with it. But Rihanna, Beyonce, mm -hmm. Anne Hathaway, these uh -huh. are some of the clients who have purchased your, exactly. your designs. Yeah. Like, but I mean, are they your target audience or is no, it the people it was who just, love them? I think what happened is I was very naturally uh, designing something that's innovative. Um, what it is, it's not out there. You know, stores who pick my brand because they think that, oh, this is actually very usually structured in this leather and this is different. This looks different, it feels different. Um, so they have the clients like Rihanna, they have clients like Beyonce, and then they come in and, oh, that looks different, and then they pick it. I think at this point, I have to say the community is the inspiration for me. So. The community um, that you live in? Yeah, community that uh, it authentically uh, created. So I have this community who follows Singa brand and and they we do a lot of communications. We uh, You have a YouTube channel. Yeah, YouTube channel also I have. Uh, when you say community, what, what are they giving you? Like what do they give you as a designer that inspires you to keep on? Oh, oh, they're giving me your so output. much. I love them so much. <laughs> um, uh, I don't really say love, but this is actually, this means a lot because I, yeah. Uh, anyways, um, yeah, they give so much. They they know so much now about Senga brand. And we have such nice, intimate, authentic um, uh, uh, 
story sharing, uh, a nice space. Uh, it got built at uh, YouTube, through social media, through because this high, high technology really enable this type of uh, space to grow. So um, there's a pros and cons. This is a big pros. So we got to have this, you know, amazing community members, and they knew so much. They they're the one tell me hmm. that I want that, I want this, and and then you are that. So it would be great for us to have this, and they're the one who actually tell me, and what they want, and that's the inspiration. I love the way you talk about how tech. You mentioned this earlier, how tech has really changed how fashion gets disseminated and shared and developed. Um, have you looked towards um, other cultures for influence? And do you feel that technology is, is one of your ways of doing that? It's part of it. It's, it's, uh, it's an ingredient of whatever you do now. It, it, that's how I put it. It's just, that's it. Like it's, not, it's like when we start having this all digital uh, sources for marketing, we say, like, oh, digital marketing. No, no, it's not a digital marketing. It's a marketing. Mm. So it's the same thing. The technology is like, oh, we're, we're doing this digital technology. Uh, it's not it. It's just part of it. Um, so actually, this is our next venture that we're working on right now. It's called Senga Store Media. So it is a virtual uh, community playground with um, the cutting edge marketplace. So we're building. Um, so this is this is our new venture. This is this is our very exciting uh, project. Not project. It's it's uh, basically it's, it's my new vision. <laughs> so we're working on. Um, um, it is it is a virtual a virtual community space, a playground. We just hang out there, and then it's heavily uh, uh, rely on technology, the new software that we're building. And so so we're gonna have all contents in it. So we're gonna just have fun virtually. On this, under the same roof, we're gonna have like video, our our Senga channel, watch Senga channel, and then we're gonna have podcasts. We're gonna have live commerce at the same time, all together in like very immersive um, experience. So, so that's you would call it. It's a, it's digital, but it's it, it's like I would say it's just, it's just space. It's just it's just space for our community. Another space. And, yeah, another space for our community, and I'm very excited about it. Um, yeah, we just. We're just um, raising a seed funding round, and and um, we're having very good feedback and having good conversations, and so the, yeah, technology is is very uh, a very it's it's not a topic. It's 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 the the life that we live in now. So you may as well just um, get on it, and I think. So that's the really important, uh, the young professionals, a very, very important skill and um, is that agility, that you have to be agile, like quickly adapt and adjust and then enjoy it. Like a dancer. I wish you continued success. Thank you. And I love the fact that you really believe that you just doing you is the best path to success. Mm -hmm. um, and thank you so much for sharing so much of your story Absolutely. with thank the you. Korea Society and for the Young Professionals Network. Thank you so much for thank having you. me. Thanks, and Hina. thank you for um, being here for me too. I'm, <laughs> I'm so honored. <laughs> it was fun. Thank you. Stepping out of the shadow in my room Caught between cowboy clouds and misty moon Silver dress, sparkle eyes, crystal blue Self, I would always tell the line.